Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. On today's show, Yamamoto Watch continues. Will he be a Met after having dinner at Steve Cohen's house over the weekend? We also break down the addition of Johan Ramirez to the bullpen and answer your mailbag questions. So subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your shows. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And here's your reminder to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch every episode on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcast. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my co-host, Joe DeMeo. But before we dive into our full rundown here, of course, it's very Yoshinobu Yamamoto heavy. We do have some Mets Pod business to quickly attend to. We're excited to announce that the Mets Pod has been named a finalist in the 2024 Sports Podcast Awards for not just one category, but two. The Mets Pod is among the shortlist for both Best Baseball Podcast and Best Team Podcast. Fan voting is currently underway to determine the winners. And since we think and hope that if you're listening to this, that you truly like us, we ask that you please visit sportspodcastawards.com and give the Mets Pod a vote for both Best in Baseball and Best Team Podcast. Voting closes on January 28th. That's sportspodcastawards.com or look on SMY's Twitter or my Twitter or Joe's Twitter For a QR code, you can scan. It'll take you right to the voting page. We greatly appreciate any support. It's your support that allows this show to exist and to grow. So if you could vote for us, I'll be thankful for it. Joe will be thankful for it. Our producer, Jeff, will be thankful for it. Maybe Joe, maybe we'll get some more MetsPod t-shirts out of this somehow. More success for us. We'll see. But we are, we're really, really excited about uh, at least being in the mix here. All right, enough of my blabbering here, Joe. We are on... Yamamoto watches feels like uh, Anchorman, the original one where they go out to Brian Fantana and they're like Panda Watch Day Forty Five, and it's like <laughs> we have not like nothing's really happening. You're getting an occasional tweet uh, over the weekend. We obviously got the big news that he had dinner at Steve Cohen's house, but it felt like that was kind of followed up with. But he while he's on the East Coast, he's also meeting with the Yankees and the Dodgers and the Mets and the Yankees are still the three most notable teams in this right now. I guess I'll just start with the most simple question I can ask you, Joe. What is your gut feel on all of this? Because basically across all of Mets land, the fans seem pretty pessimistic. A lot of the talking heads seem pessimistic. A lot of the national media absolutely classifies the Yankees as the favorite and the Dodgers as a sleeping giant, where the Mets are viewed, I don't want to say a long shot because of the money they have, but they are definitely not viewed as the top dog in this. So where's your head at? There's no favorite. Andy Martino has even tweeted. No one knows what's actually going on. We're we're at the point in this search that's been going on for so long that we're breaking down like verbiage of tweets from John Heyman or Andy Martino. It's just like John Heyman said, that Yamamoto asked for the Yankee meeting and everyone was like, oh my God, he asked for the Yankee meeting as if he didn't ask for the Mets meeting. Obviously, how'd the Mets get him to fly across the country? They were like, hey, Yoshinobu, want to come over for dinner 3,000 miles away? Of course, it's his idea. There are no favorites right now. Offers are coming in as we speak. Um, It's definitely a wide open race. I think if you are trying to talk about this right now with any sense of knowledge, you're lying. So we're not in the business of lying. We don't exactly know what's going on. What we do know is the Mets are as invested in this search as I've seen them be invested in a free agent in some time. And when you fly across the world as the owner of the team, to Japan to meet with a player and his family, that's a personal touch. And when you get that second meeting with the player and you have them over to your home for dinner, that's a personal touch. And you combine those personal touches with the money that Steve Cohen has. And I think those personal touches show how in 
He is on Yoshinobu Yamamoto, which leads me to believe the Mets are going to make sure they are the higher, highest bid in this sweepstakes. And if that's the case, go to him in Japan, have him to your house for dinner, offer the most money. There is nothing else you can possibly ask of the Mets or Steve Cohen in this case. At the end of the day, you can do everything you in your power. You cannot force somebody to take your money or want to play for your team. But Steve Cohen is pulling out all the stops here. Right. What it comes down to, Joe, something we've talked about, you always think in negotiations and in this case, something we have not seen. It was like a while. This is a free agent that every big market team is yeah. in, right? I mean, it, it came out in the next three hours, like the Giants got him. It'd be like, oh, I mean, the Giants have been trying to pay somebody a lot of money for a long time. This is a weird free agent that you have all these powerhouse, financial powerhouses in on the player. So you sit there and you ask yourself really, okay, what can we do? Like, what is our bargaining chip here? And then for the Mets, it's literally cash. It's literally cash because we've read about it and we've heard about it. It could be the, the Yankees history that he's interested in. With the Dodgers, who knows? We've seen some say he doesn't want to be in the shadow of a Shohei Otani level Japanese star. We've also heard Shohei was at the meeting and that's a big deal. So we don't know, but that could be a bargaining chip for the Dodgers. And it's not that the Yankees and Dodgers don't have a ton of money. They do. They, I mean, look at the payrolls. You don't need to look further. But Steve Cohen, if he wants, and we don't know that, but if he wants to in this scenario, wants to not match the highest bid, but exceed it by 50, 60 million dollars, is that something that Yamamoto looks at and goes, well, number one, you clearly want me the most, and it's not even close. And number two, while a lot of people go, well, it's not at that amount of money, it's not everything. That's a big gap. It's a lot of money. And it's not just the money. It's the respect factor. You're the highest paid pitcher in baseball history, whatever it may be. So we're not saying the Mets are going to do that. But if you're looking for a reason to at least feel somewhat optimistic, if you're looking for the glass half full side of this, whether he signs with the Mets or not, Joe, I think ultimately they want this player enough that they will outbid the other teams, not by, hey, we're giving you a million dollars more per year, but maybe more of a, hey, we gave three more years and 50 total million more. It's It could be significant. I mean, if you're talking about 10 years and an extra $50 million, that's like, that's the cost of Joey Wendell and Jorge Lopez basically per year. So you can replace those guys. It's something that Steve Cohen can easily do and much more easily stomach than maybe what some other teams can. Uh, on the ancillary side, which is where this market really has become like, in a sense, almost a three-team race where it's Mets have money, Yankees have history, Dodgers have superstars. So like the Yankees and Dodgers are much more ancillary in what their top things that they could offer, whereas the Mets, it's money. But from that standpoint, the Mets can say, you are our ace for the next 10 years. The Yankees cannot say that because they have Garrett Cole. The Dodgers cannot say that because Shohei Otani is presumably coming back pitching. And even if Yamamoto is at the front of their rotation per se, Shohei Otani is the biggest star in the sport. So Yamamoto is overshadowed. With the Mets, if he has the desire to be in the spotlight and be the top guy, Yamamoto could be the top guy on the Mets if he comes over and performs like he's capable of. So we don't know what's in this guy's head, but what we know is we're getting closer and closer to a decision. Heck, if you're listening to this podcast on Wednesday, there may be another podcast in your feed in the next few minutes that Yamamoto has signed somewhere. So we are on Yamamoto watch in a significant way. I believe without any sourcing, of course, that the Mets have as good a chance as anyone because money talks. And obviously, we'll find that out here in, in the coming days. That's exactly it. We'll see. I mean, th just the the fact that they flew out to Japan, that was a big sign. Then they had him come to Steve Cohen's house where, just to recap, you have the manager there. 
You have the pitching coach there. Like, this isn't just a, you know, a light interest. This is when these meetings happen typically in free agency across sports with a coaching staff involved, you start to lay out a plan or you can answer questions from the player. This is our plan for you. When you look at a guy like David Stearns or Steve Cohen, it can go beyond baseball as well. This can be our marketing plan for you. This is how we view you. We want you to start opening day. Right? That's uh, yeah. that's a pretty big deal. I mean, that's not – Garrett Cole is starting opening day for the Yankees. We can confidently say that. It's with the Mets right here. Um, this is a scenario where it's it's all about Yamamoto. And, and I and think – don't forget, the closer was there. Alex Cohen was there. And Alex right. Cohen has proven to be a deal closer with Verlander, she's a, with Scherzer. She, she's been she's a big piece She's been involved in, in really, really uh, big-time free agent acquisitions. So, I mean, now we play the waiting game, and we don't expect it to be that much longer. This has gone on long enough, and this is a scenario where he's had multiple meetings with some of the favorites or front runners, or like I said, we could be surprised in the end because some things are kept really, uh, really on the down low in baseball. But... Let's have some fun with this, Joe. Uh, let's make a contract prediction. And, and this isn't, I guess we we should do one for the Mets and one if he doesn't sign with the Mets. Because my personal belief is that the Mets deal will look a lot different than if he went to, say, the Dodgers or the Yankees. Do you want, do you want to go first? And I'll let you pick which contract you go first, and then we can snake sure. it back to me. I'll go Mets. Okay. I'll say a Mets contract for Yamamoto is 11 years, $330 million. So biggest contract in the history for a pitcher, 11 years. So you do that extra year or two to spread out uh, the luxury tax payments and an opt out after year five, something like that. So if he is everything that he thinks he's going to be and the Mets obviously would think he is by offering this contract, then he could re-enter the market at 30 years old and still in be in position to get another seven plus year deal. So that that's what I'll go. 11 330 with an opt out after five. All right. So I'm going to think it's a little higher than that. Now that's still a massive deal, by the way. Like that's if the Mets get this done, I think we're getting to 350. I do. Or even a little bit higher. And I I'll say I think you're right on it. I think this is looking at a deal that he gets. He basically gets both sides of the bargaining chip. That's what he's earned at this point where you're on it, Joe. He gets the longevity and the security of that 10, 11 deer. I'll say 10, 350. You went with 11, 330. Yep. And one thing to account for here is the posting fee that comes along with it. And right, at, at, at 330 million, the with the posting fee, that's going to come to about a four hundred million dollar total package because at three thirty, it's like fifty million, so up because it, it's all percentage based. So okay. it'll put your total package right around four hundred million dollars, including the lump sum check that you have to write to Oryx in Japan. Oh man, that is a wild factor in it for sure. I completely agree with you. He's going to get the opt out. I really, really do. Which makes me wonder, and I don't think this will happen. But I, I'll put it at like the one percent. It makes me wonder if the Yamamoto deal shocks us all, and it ends up being a five-year, two hundred million dollar deal, like something where it's like, whoa, the AA, the annual average was unlike anything we were expecting. But he's confident enough of himself that he's going to be a thirty-year-old powerhouse free agent, and he'll be able to go back to the bargaining table. Um, and obviously cash in again on a 10-year deal or whatever it may be. But I, I agree with you, Joe, that the favorite of this is he gets the opt-out and that he gets to be a 29- or 30-year-old free agent if he wants to be. And the beauty of it for Yamamoto when you have this kind of leverage in free agency is that if you don't pitch up to expectations, well, you're owed every last... You don't have to opt out. You could just take the rest of your contract anyway. So that's where we've landed with him. Okay, let's do... If it's not the Mets, I think the number will be lower, Joe. I think for the Yankees situation, we'd be looking at, I'd say closer to 8 to 95. Am I in the ballpark here? And I, I count the Dodgers are in a similar mold. I think they have no problem spending a lot of money, 
But I think if it's a non-Mets team, I think the deal looks a little different. I would subtract about three years and 30 to $50 million. I think that's about right. And I, I think when you're the Yankees, you want to be careful with Garrett Cole because we talk about how the Mets could make him the highest paid pitcher in history. What does that say? I mean, Garrett Cole is doing fine regardless, but what does that say to Garrett Cole if you sign a different pitcher? It's a thing though money? in sports. Yeah, it is. It's a pride thing, like you said, and it's it's a respect thing is really more what the finances are about. So I, I'm kind of in the same range. I figure the Yankees would be like 8 to 90, 8 to 95. I think people on Twitter and online have inflated the market a little bit out of sheer, we don't know what's going on. So the cost just must be going up by $50 million, $60 million. I think most of the bids will be around 300 maybe a tick under, maybe a tick over. And like we've talked about, if the Mets want to get them, then you go ahead and you step up and you offer $30, $40 million more. And if he turns you down at that point, like if it comes out, he signs with the Yankees for eight years, 290, and the Mets offered 10 or 11, 335, 340, whatever, and he turned down that money, there's nothing you could do. Like you right. just, it is what it is. He wanted to be there. So I expect aggressive bids all around, but the Mets to be kind of a, a real step ahead of the rest of the market. All right, final prediction, Joe. What is the shelf life of the episode we're currently recording? Joe and I are sitting here getting close to the evening on a Tuesday. I, I mean, for me, I think the over, I'll set the over under for you. I love setting markets. At, uh, we'll give it 36 hours, Joe, over under. And I'll mark it as a timestamp. It's Tuesday at five is what I'll say is when that 36 hour window begins. Uh, I'm going to say under just because I'm going to a Christmas dinner with my mom on Wednesday at 6 p.m. And I'll be out at a restaurant and that's when it'll happen. So I can't imagine it's going to happen while I'm just lounging on the couch watching no. Elf for Christmas vacation and just hanging out and watching TV. It's going to be while I'm out. So I, I'll take the under just because I'm going somewhere on Wednesday. That checks out. Yeah, one of us or both of us will be extremely busy. And it'll listen, it, you know, to kind of peek behind the curtain here, if the Mets get Yamamoto, there will be a Mets pod episode in your feed as soon as we can get it to you. There will be an emergency pod. If they don't get Yamamoto... There'll probably still be an emergency pod in your feed because we are going to be thinking, what's next? And we've had those conversations on this show, but it's a little different when it's, you know, crunch time, Joe, and it's like, okay, he's in the rearview mirror. Now here's what you're going to do or not going to do. Okay, getting away from Yamamoto, which we have spent, I would say, 68% of this show in the last four months on Yamamoto, which I don't mind. Everybody, it's what everyone's interested in. We, you and I have been excited about him, I feel like since July at this point. But we do have to talk about the rest of the team at some point. The Mets get Johan Ramirez you know, for cash here. And Joe, there's a conversation to be had about the player who had some success with the Pirates last year. Ultimately, the White Sox move on from him. To me, this move was, okay, I'm starting to see some bullpen strategy from David Stearns here. I'm starting to see the, we're going to take a flyer on this arm and we are going to look for guys in very defined roles. So first off, I wanted your take on just Johan Ramirez as a player. And if you kind of saw it like me in a sense that, okay, they're trying to get something here on the margins, extremely low cost, but a guy that has had many successful runs at the major league level in recent history. What David Stern said, I believe it was at the winter meetings when talking about how he wants to build a bullpen. He wants to build it with unique arm angles, unique pitch angles. He wants each reliever to kind of look different. You don't just want a bunch of, you know, four seam fastballs that have, you know, 15 inch of vertical break, like everything the same because hitters are able to pick up on that. When you look at someone like Johan Ramirez, where he's a little unique and interesting to me, I, I think he's going to be much more effective against right-handed hitters than he is against lefties. But it's a, a sinker sweeper guy. Sinker is mid-90s, average 95.1 miles an hour this past year. Sweeper gets you know north of 15 inches of horizontal break. 
what stands out when I look at his numbers and, you know, obviously anyone could go on baseball reference and see an ERA over four, which led to a lot of fans rolling their eyes. I look a little deeper. You go under the hood a little bit and where Johan Ramirez stands out is a lot of times when we talk about relievers, you're talking about, you're looking at strikeout rate. Strikeout rate is just not the biggest part of Johan Ramirez's game. He's going to strike out like eight guys per nine innings. His game is inducing weak contact, missing barrels, ground balls. He had a 60, almost a 61% ground ball rate this year. So what's really imperative for uh, Ramirez's success with the Mets is infield defense. That's where Lin Lindor will obviously step up in a big way as a gold glove caliber shortstop. Jeff McNeil has proven historically to be a good defensive second baseman. Third base, bit of a question with, you know, Brett Beatty right now kind of penciled in and we'll see what they do the rest of the offseason. But for a guy that got designated for assignment twice, I guess, in, in the last months, but most recently by the White Sox to make room for Eric Fetty, who was kind of almost a Met in a way, as the Mets were in on Eric Fetty. Fetty watch was a thing. Yes, so we get uh, Johan Ramirez in a Mets uniform, and I think it's just uh, a potential interesting arm and is showing, like you said, Connor, that David Stearns wants to build a bullpen just with all differing types of pitchers instead of just a bunch of fireballers. Joe, you brought up the success against righties. For his career, he's held righties to a 579 OPS and a batting average of 181. So this is somebody that... I know we're in an era of baseball with the batter limit that the specialist, it's not that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's less extinct. valuable. It's less valuable. That's right. But if you're looking at, I mean, at those numbers and you're not putting this guy, he's not, you're not saying this is our setup, man. You're not saying this is a high leverage guy. We're not even saying he's a sixth inning guy necessarily. You're saying, can he maybe be a weapon in a sense that, hey, it wasn't Drew Smith's night in the seventh. There's two runners on. There's one out. But the next three batters in the lineup are righties, and we're going to give this guy a shot. And the worst case is you use that to force a manager to pinch hit one of his good righties up there for a lefty on the bench. And then you can keep making moves. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, listen, we're not going to sit here and act like Johan Ramirez as they got another Edwin Diaz in the bullpen. But the point is... With relievers, if you can find success in a very defined role, then he's got a shot. And in the Mets bullpen, um, this is everybody's got a shot right now. So you can kind of see the the mind of Stearns working on this one. All right, you're listening to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your shows. You know we're not closing out this one Without answering some of your mailbag questions, you could send your mailbag questions to Joe at PSL to Flushing. I'm at Connor J. Rogers on Twitter. All right, this first one from an insane Mets fan. Besides Yamamoto, is there anyone in any position you'd want the Mets to give a multi-year deal to? For me, Joe, the only My one is Soler. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Jorge Soler makes sense. If you could get him for three, I think that's doable. Uh, but at the end of the day... I'm going one or two years on basically anything regardless. And, you know, maybe that's a Justin Turner where it's a year and a, a vesting option, or maybe you do have to go to two with an opt out or something along those lines. I don't think the Mets are in a spot one for them. And two, when you look at this market, I understand we're in the confines of the market that exists. It's just not that strong of a market. That's, like, uh, I think Otani held up the market a bit. I think Yamamoto is holding up the market a bit. But I think that's also been slightly overstated. I don't think teams are in a rush to commit years and dollars to most of the players that are out there. We're, you're, in a way, trying to make players more than what they are. And, you know, they're all going to get jobs. And some guys will get paid more than they're worth. And some guys you'll get kind of steals on late in the offseason. But to me, I think the Mets need to operate almost exclusively in the one to two year market outside of Yamamoto. Obviously, I'd go 11, like I said, without uh, a, a major issue. Otherwise, just one to two years and let other teams commit the length to these players that probably aren't major impact players in 2024. 
And maybe we've already seen that hand tipped a little bit with the interest in Justin Turner, right? That's a yeah. guy that, you know, at 39 years old, he's going to be playing on one-year deals. It's going to be a lot of money, but it's a one-year deal. And in the Cohen era, one-year deals really don't matter. The next one from Tyler Boyce. Hey, Joe, should Brandon Woodruff be talked about the Mets, uh, should be more talked about with the Mets' competitive timeline? Joe, we've, we've briefly touched on Woodruff because if you look at the 2025 model, it does make a lot of sense because then you have a big-time player in peace for your 2025, and you'd be paying him now with the assumption he's not going to give you a lot this year. I mean, you, you would anything. assume you're getting nothing. Yeah, you're you'd nothing. assume you're getting nothing. Yeah, I would sign Brandon Woodruff regardless of Yoshinobu Yamamoto or anything else. To me, I would sign Brandon Woodruff with the idea that he is a 2025 asset. Obviously, I'm not privy to the medicals. So as long as medically you look at it, you say, we feel pretty confident that 2025 he'll be 85% of what Brandon Woodruff was, 90%. That's still a premium pitcher, and that's going to be at a discounted value. I mean, when you look at what Tyler Maley got, or Molly, however he says his last name, signed yeah. with Texas, he's... He signed two years, twenty-two million. So Woodruff's probably a, a little above that. Is it two thirty? Is it two twenty-eight? Something like that. You're getting a pitcher of Brandon Woodruff's quality for you know, maybe fourteen million dollars in two thousand twenty-five. Because when you look at how this rotation is built, Yamamoto or not, Jose Quintana is a free agent after twenty twenty-four. Luis Severino signed a one-year deal. So kind of regardless of how you fill in this rotation. You're going to have rotation holes next year to fill. So if you can take care of one of those now and deal with the luxury tax payment that you're already paying in 2024 in order to get a potential discount in 2025, uh, to me, Brandon Woodruff couldn't possibly make more sense for the Mets. All right, this one from Johnny Mags. Has there ever been a free agent frenzy over one player like this before? The courting for this player is wild, and I can't wait to hear all the details when it's done. More entertaining than Otani. Well, let's not forget, Otani wanted none of this. Otani and his camp set out a stipulation that don't leak anything or you'll be out. He announced his signing on his own Instagram, which is not very common in this era of the insiders having everything. And, But to really get back to the root of the question about Yamamoto here, I think why it's in a league of its own, Joe, is because... 99% of American baseball fans have never seen him pitch. Uh, like on television. That, I mean, they go as far, at least for me, it goes as far as I've seen videos. Like you'll send me some videos. I I mean, yes, of course, um, you have, you know, there's people that have watched like the World Baseball Classic and get to see a lot of Japanese players. But the reality is, this is a guy that might exceed the highest contract for a pitcher in major league baseball and he's never pitched in the majors and fan bases want him like massive massive impact fan bases dodgers yankees mets red sox giants i mean we you know we've heard even the phillies right so i think the answer is no there's been frenzies over free agents in baseball but this one is so unique because it's an international player you have everybody in on him because he's a 25-year-old projected ace and that you and I have been covering this as long as any team podcast because of where the Mets were at this year. I remember the first time we really talked about in the pod, I think we were like, man, this could be $180 million. Like, it's getting crazy. And now it's expected yeah. to exceed 300, Joe. Yeah, I was just going to say, I remember the days when we were like, how crazy is it? This guy's going to get the biggest pitcher contract for a Japanese pitcher ever because Tanaka was at 155. And we're right. like, he might he might beat it by 50 million. That's insane. He might double what Masahiro Tanaka signed with the Yankees for, which is just crazy. And that's what I think one of the things that makes it unique, like you said, Connor, I do agree from like the international standpoint, the mystery, that's a big thing. What makes it so unique is... I can't remember the last time there was a premium free agent that the Mets, the Yankees, and the Dodgers were not just interested in, were all in on. Like, this is not just 
the Mets really want him and the Yankees and Dodgers are hanging around and seeing if he'll sign with them. They want him very badly too. So what makes this so unique is that fact that you're talking about three, it might be the three highest payrolls in baseball this year. All of them want Yoshinobu Yamamoto in a meaningful way. And that is what is leading to us talk about contract length of eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years, wherever, somewhere in that vicinity, 300 plus million dollars plus the posting fee. It's because all of those big market teams are involved. And don't get me wrong, the, there will be a frenzy next year for Juan Soto because he is also yeah. a 25 year old free agent, superstar. He's, he's on the Yankees now. So, like, the Yankees will want to retain him. The Mets will be in on Soto. I guarantee it. And a ton of other great teams. Hey, but whoever as, misses, whoever misses on Yamamoto, they have I think, this, beca I think becomes the favorite yeah. for Soto. Yeah, they have I, money yeah. hanging out in their pocket waiting for next year. For uh, the rarity of it is the age, right? Like an right. established superstar at that age where you're paying for years going into the prime years. That's the difference. Now, while I'll say it won't be the same as this, as much as the baseball fan will be glued to it and excited because we know the greatness of Juan Soto. Yamamoto's is going longer because Yamamoto is uprooting his entire life. Juan Soto already did that. He's already done the adjustment of coming to America and he'll, I'm sure he'll do a tour and meet with teams, but Yamamoto, like there are extensive plans. There's a language barrier here. There is a culture barrier. Like there are so many unique things that, I, that's why when people are like, can this guy get on with it already? Okay, <laughs> I'll say to the average yeah. fan saying that, what if you had to go pick your employer over in Japan and you don't speak Japanese and everybody wants you and you need to find the right fit where you're comfortable and where you're going to get the most money and where your family is come? Like this is not a simplistic decision. So that is part of what's created the aura around this and the frenzy. And I think, Joe, that's why it's going to be really hard to replicate something like this uh, until Sasaki. <laughs> And that's going to be a different beast because if he's next year, he won't even be eligible for the same posting rules that exactly. Yamamoto is. He'll have to sign for like six million dollars, and that's just going to be sheer, uh, you know, recruiting. It's almost like college football where you're recruiting a, a, a very yeah, young player. It really is. But great point about Japan overseas, the whole transition. We we said it, I think, on last week's show. It's not like moving from California to Florida, or, or you know. Florida to New York, it's it's a, a game changer in, in a lot of ways. And I think, too, before we move on to the next one, uh, the deadline plays a role, too. There's an actual deadline. He has to sign by January 4th or he cannot come to America. Whereas Juan Soto, as a Scott Boris client, how many times have we seen those markets go into mid-January, late oh. January, February? Please, I no. Mean, <laughs> I, I'm... Please no, but it could happen, right? It depends on how aggressive people are. He also uh, signed Garrett Cole during the winter meetings, so he's done kind of every side of the things. But knowing there is a true end date on Yamamoto, I think has added almost to the anxiety level of just like, all right, let's go. You only got a, you got a couple more weeks. You got to decide. But it's a tough decision for him. This is the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV. From inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan, visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. Once again, please visit sportspodcastawards.com and drop us some votes for both Best Baseball and Best Team Podcast. It's all Joe and I want for Christmas. We got our Mets Pod shirts now. Our next ask from the fans, not Santa Claus, from the fans is to vote for us to take home these awards. We appreciate it. Remember to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your podcasts. Yamamoto Watch continues. Thanks so much, everybody.